Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's 5 a.m. Get up, get up, get up. It's your girl, Reverend Rashida Lee. Get up, get up, get up. Come on, you already know it's Breakfast with Jesus. Get up, get up, get up. Wake up. Get up, get up, get up. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice. Come on, you got to rejoice. It's Monday. Come on, it's the thought of a new week. You got to get up. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, hey y'all. I see y'all, I see y'all, I miss y'all so much. Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 30, it's, I gotta read it out of the message version and the NIV version because the message version, y'all know I love the message version, but I gotta read it in the NIV version. It says, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. How many times have you called for help and he healed you? It says, Lord, you brought me up from the realm of the dead and you spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name for his anger lasts only a moment. Come on, somebody say his anger only lasts a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Somebody say favor going to keep following me and following me and following me. I'm telling you, I'm going to have favor after favor after favor because his favor lasts a lifetime. It says in Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, it says, Weeping may stay for the night. Weeping may stay for the night. That means that we only got to cry one night. We ain't got to cry for long. Weeping may endure for the night. That's what the King James Version said. It says, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Who is excited this morning? Who woke up this morning ready to rejoice? I know sometimes people wake up still sad from the night before, but I'm telling you today that you can rejoice this morning. Somebody say good morning. We got a brand new morning to rejoice. It says weeping may stay for the night. That means singular, the night. But rejoicing, I come to rejoice with you this morning. I come to lift up his name. I come to shout to the Lord. I come to extol the Lord today. I come to bless the God today. Did you come to bless God with us this morning? I'm excited. It says, when I felt secure, I said I will never be shaken. See, when you're secure, you can stand firm. And David said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. David had a moment where God hid his face. He felt like, God, it was a moment when I messed up and you hid your face from me. But that, that's what David did. He repented. He asked God for forgiveness. He asked God to create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Come on. It was a time where David messed up too. And he felt like God had hit his face. And he was dismayed. But this is what it says in verse 8. It says, but to you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. See, when David messed up, he knew to cry for mercy. He was the king of Israel. And he messed up. And he cried for mercy. It says, what is gained if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? See, I ain't letting no dust praise God for me. It says, will the dust praise you? Are you going to let a rock cry out for you? If you need God, who are you going to do? Who are you going to let do it for you? You got to do it for yourself. It says, will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. Chapter 30 of um verse of Psalm chapter 30. I'm sorry. It says, verse 11. David said, Lord, you turn my wailing into dancing. You turn my mourning into dancing. You turn my crying into dancing. You turn my weeping into dancing. How many of you? 
can truly say that you cried so long and I'm so tired of crying and now I can dance. Now I can laugh. Now I can smile. I know it still hurts sometimes, but I'm telling you that if you're a little bit like David, you can say you turned my mourning into dancing. You turned my sadness into joy. David had enough in him to say, God, I know I've been crying. I know it's been hard, but you turned my welling into dancing. You removed my sack cloth and clothed me with joy. See, he will do it for you, but you got to be willing to celebrate God. You got to be willing to say, God, be my help. You got to be willing to shout to God and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. I'm not happy yet. I'm not full of joy yet. I still need you, God. And he will turn your sadness into joy. He will clothe you with joy. You just got to cry out like David did. David was not afraid. To proclaim his goodness. He was not afraid to praise him. He was not afraid to lift him up. He was not afraid to share his name. It says. In Psalm chapter 30 verse 12. It says that my heart. May sing your praises. And not be silent. See when you in a season. When you know you're going through. You cannot be silent. You got to share with God. You got to let God know what you're dealing with. You got to tell God that I'm in pain. I'm hurting. I don't like it. I don't feel good. It is not a good feeling. And guess what? He will turn your song into a praise. <laughs> he will turn your song into a shout. He will turn your song around. You will no longer be singing sad songs. You will be singing songs of Zion. You will be singing joy is in the morning. You will get excited. So I'm telling you, don't be silent. Don't let the rocks cry out for you. Be honest with God. Let him know what you're dealing with. Let him know that I'm sad. But I'm telling you, it's time to celebrate. It's time to celebrate. It's time to celebrate today. It's time to give God all of your heart today. Why? Because God is always faithful. He's always faithful. Even when you're sad. Even when things aren't going well. I want to read out of the message version. Psalm chapter 30, it says, I give you all the credit, God. You got me out of that mess. See, only God can get you out of mess. And David knew it was nobody but God that got him out of the mess that he was in. You got to know who is going to get you out of the mess that you're in. And David knew exactly who it was. He said, I give you all the credit, God. You got me out of that mess. You didn't let my foes gloat you didn't let my enemies gloat over me you didn't let them talk about me you didn't let them slander my name your name it says god my god i yelled for help and you put me together see if you're all over the place if you got a whole bunch of stuff going on if you feel like you just shattered in pieces it says he yelled for help you gotta give it all to god not to man, but to God. He yelled to God for help. And God put him back together. I know some of us got a whole lot of stuff going on. And we can't, we just can't get it together. But I'm telling you, if you scream and yell to God and let him know, not yell like, oh, Lord, help me. But no, Lord, I need your help today. I need you right now with tears in your eyes, screaming, on your knees, crying, with your hands held up high, surrendering all. He will put you back together. It's the word. He did it for David. So if he did it for David, the king, he will definitely do it for you. David messed up too. It says, God, you pulled me out of the grave. Gave me another chance at life when I was down and out. I love the message version because it makes it so clear that sometimes... We feel like we ain't got another chance. But David reminds us that God will give you another chance at life. Sometimes we feel like that's it. I just want to give up. I'm tired. I want to throw in the towel. I just want to get under my covers, pull the covers over my head, close the curtains and be done with it. But David reminded us that when he was down and out, he had a new song. Somebody say, I got a new song. I'm going to sing a new song. I'm not going to let my yesterday. Oh my God. Don't let your yesterday affect you today. You got a brand new day with brand new mercies. Brand new joy. Brand new love. 
Brand new deliverance. You got a new day. It's Monday. You got a brand new start of a new week. And David reminds us that he gave him another chance at life. You got another chance at life. You know, I was on the call yesterday on Anitra's call on Zoom for the, um, on Grieving with Hope. And I just was listening to the women dealing with grief and how they lost loved ones. And people are dealing with loss after loss after loss after loss. And God has given them another chance, just an opportunity to be able to share their heart with other people. To be able to get it out. To be able to get it off their heart. To be able to have an opportunity to clear their mind. And to know that there is help. That there is another chance at life. We have platforms now to remind us that we have another chance. That we can change our song. That our song don't have to stay the same. But it's a daily walk. It's not going to happen overnight. This is why we got to study every day. This is why we got to read the word every day. This is why we got to stay in good communities with great people that is willing to share. I was encouraged. And I haven't been, I haven't, um, been in a place of sadness or grief about my mom in years. But she has some thought provoking questions that made me think about some stuff. And I'm like, wow, God had really turned my mourning into dancing. That my song have changed. And I'm praying that God will change their, their song too. Because he can give you another chance at life. But it's how do you look at life? What is your vantage point? Do you really look at it in a way that you want to stay in that position? Or do you want to change your story? And I love the way Anitra gives so many opportunities to allow them to share and ways to let them be able to um, release. See, God said we can release any kind of way we want. He tells us to yell. He tells us to scream. He tells us to shout. He allows us to praise. He allows us to dance. He allows us to fast. He allows us to cry. Any way you can, but release it. You got to get it out. Tell somebody. That's why we said, that's why the word allows us to set, um, allow us to share each other burdens. This is what David is reminding us. That he will pull you out of the pit of depression. He will pull you out of the pit of sadness. He will pull you out of the pit of procrastination. We are in so many different pits of loneliness. And God is reminding us today in Psalm chapter 30. That he will change your morning into dancing. So I say good morning to you. That you got another chance to dance. You have another chance to smile. You have another chance to yell and tell God your story. And let him know that today I'm not happy. It don't feel too good. But the Bible reminds me that I can change my song. That I can change my story. That I can make the difference. Just in the, my delivery to God. It says in Psalm chapter 30 in the message version. I'm almost done. It says all you saints sing your hearts out to God. <laughs> I love this because when we go through anything, you can get in your car. You can go in the bathroom. You can go in your bedroom, turn the music up loud and just shout and sing and let the words permeate your heart. Allow God to allow to soothe your soul with song. It changes your heart when you sing. I don't care if you got the worst sound when you, when you open your mouth, but sing unto the Lord. It says, sing your hearts out to God. Thank him to his face. This is what the message verse say. Psalm chapter 30, verse four. It says, thank him to his face. When was the last time you thanked God for everything? Thank him to his face. When was the last time that you thanked God to his face? Just you and him, just in your own space and say, God, I thank you. I thank you for this moment. 
I thank you for the opportunity to live again. I thank you for the opportunity to hear the word again. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to read and understand. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to get up again. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to use my limbs. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to help somebody. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to have sisters and brothers in Christ. I thank you for pulling me out of the pit of hell. I thank you for changing my relationships. I thank you for changing my, my pocketbook. I thank you for changing the decibels in my bank account. I thank you for changing my heart. I thank you for changing my heart posture. I thank you, God, for changing my healing. I thank you for changing the doctor's report. I thank you for changing the, the report at the, at the courthouse. I thank you, God. When was the last time you thanked him to his face? Yesterday was a thankful moment for me. After I got off alive, you know, I talked about forgiveness and I want to um, share um, that what I didn't share yesterday about repentance because repentance still is necessary. Right. But I, I wrote down some notes and I wanted to share them this morning. But yesterday was a, a pivotal moment for me because as I was teaching you guys about forgiveness, God said in my heart, I thought I didn't have nobody to forgive. I thought I was OK. And my heart was so full yesterday after I got off the call that I had to make my way out the door of my office. And when I left out of my office, Dwayne was standing at the door and he had his Bible in his hand. I'm like, what are you doing? And he was like, I was out in the hallway listening to you because I had my door shut. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you was listening to me. He said, yeah, every time I'm home on Sunday mornings, I listen to you. And I said, oh, I came in the office because I didn't want to wake you up. And he was like, well, I, I want to listen because I want to hear you know, the word, I wanted to hear what you had to say this morning. And, and I said, well, what did you learn? And he said, I learned about the different judges. He said, I learned about forgiveness. And he said, it was really good. And I said, well, I'm glad that you was listening. And I said, well, I'm glad because I was about to come downstairs because God laid on my heart that I need to forgive you. And I was, as I was talking, it was like a weight was lifting off of me, y'all. It was so crazy. And I had to ask God to forgive me because of my response to my husband is not always godly. And I'm thinking because I'm not doing nothing in a harmful way or a bad way, but because of my response, sometimes my response is silent and I'm not saying anything. And that's not godly because God don't want us to be so silent that we're being resentful and being hurtful. And my silence was unfair and God made me apologize and ask for forgiveness so that I can move forward. And I was like, I was saying to God while I was in my office, I didn't even do anything wrong, but he made me ask for forgiveness. And I'm telling you, I was so free in that moment. I'm sharing this with you this morning because I know that a lot of times people think that the, the leaders got it all together. And because we studying the word and we teaching the word that we all good. But I'm telling you that God arrested my spirit yesterday when I got off this call. And yesterday was the very first time that my husband and I got in the car together and went to church in the last eight months. The very first time that I went to church with my husband. And as much as I study the word, as much as I fast, as much as I am inundated in the word of God, as much as I feel like I do right, I try not to sin. I do everything that I can, but God knew what was still in my heart. And I'm telling you that yesterday felt like a brand new day for me. I was able to walk into the sanctuary with my husband and my daughter by my side. I'm telling you that I thank God to his face yesterday. And I was so excited to share with you ladies today and gentlemen, because God has, when you ask God for a thing, you be thinking that it's going to be something big. And I didn't realize how much I missed being able to sit next to my husband in the sanctuary. It's been since November the 5th. I looked on my phone and I said, Dwayne, do you know that we haven't been to church in so long together because of his schedule? And because when he used to work at the city, he was always going to, he had to always leave. And I was preaching somewhere and I was always somewhere else. And he said, well, it was, it was the last time we was at Community Baptist. 
we went to go see a young lady, Jessica, go preach. And I said, that was last year. He said, no, it wasn't. It was only a couple months ago, Rashida. And I said, no, it wasn't. And I went on my phone to find her sermon. And it was November the 5th, 2023, that the last time I was in the church house with my husband. And I'm telling you, God arrested my spirit on yesterday. And I'm telling you, I felt like I got a brand new start, a brand new opportunity to be able to turn some stuff around just for me teaching you about forgiveness yesterday. And I had to repent. I'm like, God, forgive me because I don't want nothing to block what God has set up for me. But that's why we got to be willing to get down on our knees and ask God. The same thing I tell you to do is the same thing I do. Because I don't want God to hinder anything from me, from me because I have unforgiveness. Or I'm not in a place where I need to do what's right when I think I'm already right. And I, I do this. I want the same thing for you. I don't want for me, for me, and don't want it for you. I want the same thing for you. So yesterday, if you didn't take the time to ask for forgiveness from someone, that's close to you or somebody that you haven't seen in a while, somebody that have done something to you that have hurt you and you don't want to forgive. I'm telling you today, don't let this day go by. Even if they harmed you, even if they hurt you, I'm telling you today to make it your business to get on your knees when we get off this call and ask God to turn your morning into dancing. Change my story. Change my narrative. Please, God, Change the narrative. So many people are praying for you. So many people care about your story changing. You might not think so, but somebody cares. I know somebody care enough for me to keep praying for me when I didn't want nobody to pray for me. Sharon will tell you. I'm like, look, I'm good. Y'all don't got to pray for me. I'm, I'll be good. But people still kept praying. You know why? Because God needs to hear his word. The prayers of the righteous avail it much. We got to keep God's word on our heart. We got to keep people before God. We got to share to God and let him know that my sister is hurting. My brother is hurting. God, I need you to help them. And guess what? He'll do it on your behalf. For your sister or brother, you can intercede for them. And that's what so many people have done for me. So I'm doing the same thing for you. I pray that God will turn your story around. He will turn your situation around. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever issue that you have today, if you have a problem that you need to ask somebody for forgiveness, I ask God to do it today the same way he did it for me. He arrested my spirit yesterday. So I thank God for this ministry because it's necessary for me. I need it. And I, I know, I know your lives are changing. I see it. Your smiles are changing. Your stories are changing. Your situations are changing. Your finances are changing. Your posture is changing. Your relationship with Christ is changing. Your understanding of the word is changing. Your joy in the word is changing. I see it. So I know our heavenly father sees it. I'm going to finish reading Psalm 30. Then I'm going to go to our lesson. Psalm chapter 30, it says in verse 4, it says, he gets angry once in a while, but across a lifetime, there is only love. The nights of crying your eyes out give way to days of laughter. <laughs> the nights of crying your eyes out. I cry my eyes out a lot about my marriage, y'all. But the days come. The day will come when laughter will show up. I'm telling you. Laughter got to show up. Somebody say laughter got to show up. It has to show up. Weeping may only endure for the night. It don't say many nights. But rejoicing. But joy will come in the morning. I don't know why I'm staying here. But I got to just remind somebody. That you only going to cry for a moment. Your tears are going to dry up. Somebody say let my tears dry up. Your tears are going to dry up. And there's going to be a, a hearty laugh coming right afterwards. I'm telling you, there's going to be a hearty laugh coming. It says, when things were going great, I crowed, I got it made. See, we get excited when things are going good. And we say, I got it made. I'm God's favorite. I tell him all the time at the salon, 
I'm God's favorite. Well, David said it in his, in the word in Psalm chapter 30, verse six. He said, I'm God's favorite. <laughs> you got to know that you're God's favorite and whatever you need from him, he'll give it to you. No matter what you ask, he'll do it. No matter what you say, he'll show up for you. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that I'm God's favorite. How about you? Are you God's favorite? You got to tell yourself that I'm his favorite. He loves me. Every time I call on him, he show up. Every time I shout, he shows up. Every time I ask him for anything, he makes sure that he takes care of me. I'm his favorite. My heavenly father shows up for me. He will not allow me to be put to shame. He won't allow me to go forth without him. You got to know that he's your faith, that you're his favorite. It's room for all of us. Come on. You got to know that I'm God's favorite. Sharon always say, well, I'm his favorite too, Sheila. You ain't his only, you ain't the only one of his favorite. But I say it all the time. <laughs> I'm his favorite. You got to know it. You got to say it like you mean it. It says, he made me king of the mountain. Then you look to the other way and I fell to pieces. I call out to you, God. I laid my case before you. Can you sell me for a profit when I'm dead? Auction me off at a cemetery yard sale. When I'm dust to dust, my songs and stories of you won't sell. So listen and be kind. Help me out of this. You did it. You changed wild laments into whirling dancing. Somebody say he did it. Come on, he did it. He changed your crying into dancing. He changed your wild lament. Come on, we're not going to be lamenting in this season. We're not going to keep crying out. We're going to let these tears dry up. At some point, they got to stop. At some point, you got to laugh. At some point, you got to dance. Dance like nobody's watching. It says, you did it. Come on. He done it. He did it. It says you did it. You changed wild lament into whirling dancing. You ripped my black mourning band and decked me with wild flowers. Come on, we taking all that black off. We putting on colorful clothes. We taking them black mourning clothes off. We not at the at the grave site. We no longer there. We coming up out of that grave site. We coming up out of them dead places. We are going to laugh today. We're going to change those mourning clothes. Come on, somebody say good morning. Good morning. We got a brand new day. It says, I'm about to burst with song. <laughs> I'm about to burst with song. I can't keep quiet about you. God, my God, I can't thank you enough. That was Psalm chapter 30, the message version. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, we bless your holy and righteous name. Father, we thank you so much for turning our midnight in today. Father, we thank you so much that we don't have to keep crying. Father, I hope today is a day that will dry up the tears in one of your daughter's or son's eyes. God, somebody is crying because they're hurting, they're grieving, they're depressed, they're sad, they're lonely, and they need you today. Father, I ask you today to give them a hearty laugh. God, I ask you today to give them joy, unspeakable joy. Father, I ask you today to give them what they need to make them happy again. Father, we thank you today that you shall do it in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you today as the word said, you did it. Father, you don't, you were doing it for every one of us. One by what you know we all need you know what we need tell her made just for us so father today i ask you to show up like never before father i ask you to do it like you always do for everyone else god i ask you today to show up for us god father we are willing and able to share your word we're willing and able to lift you up we're willing and able to sing a new song god so help us today Father, we need just your kind of glory today, Father. Father, give us a rhema word that will help us out today. Father, we thank you, we love you, we honor you. Unclog our ears and massage our hearts that we might receive today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Remove Rashida. And Father, I ask you to increase you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I hope that encouraged somebody today because it truly encouraged me this morning. Well, today we are in the book of Judges. If you never studied with SGS Ministry, we are... This is our Breakfast with Jesus on Monday morning at 5 a.m. 
and I am um, in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 11. Yesterday, we were in Judges chapter 10, and we are now um, on the eighth judge. We are um, with the judge Jephthah, and this judge was now coming to save Israel. Somebody say, we need somebody to save us today. And they was given this judge, judge, um, the eighth judge, Jephthah. It says in Judges chapter 11, before I read that, before I start, I want to um, give you these points from repentance. Because yesterday I talked about forgiveness. When the Israelites sinned against God and they cried out to the Lord and God forgave them. And he's now sending them a leader to save them out of the hands of their enemy. However, they was willing to cry out and ask God to forgive them. They was not afraid to ask God to forgive them. And when we ask God for forgiveness, he allows us to ask um, with a pure heart. He allows us to be able to ask and he forgives us because of the blood shed on the cross. And because he said in his word that if we ask, he will throw our sins into the sea of forgiveness. And a lot of times we feel like because we are believers and after we ask, that's enough. And a lot of times we don't even know how. Some people just feel like, well, I ask for forgiveness and I'm done. Um, but repentance is a real thing. You know, um, John the Baptist, he came before Jesus and he was sharing with the people that you need to turn from your sins and repent. Well, a lot of us today still need to repent. We feel like, oh, well, God knows my heart and I'm okay. You know, he knows that I, I sinned and, you know, because of his blood shed on the cross. Well, it's steps to repentance. And I, um, I found as I was studying the different steps to repentance and the five steps to repentance was confession. One of the things you have to do is confess. You have to honestly admit your mistakes to God. You have to be honest in your repentance. You got to truly tell God what is wrong, the things that you have done wrong and not be afraid to open up your heart. He already know, but you got to confess. You have to say it out of your mouth and you got, you can do it with just you and God in the room. You don't got to share it with nobody else. It's a confession admitting to God. Then you have to acknowledge your wrongdoing, admitting that you was wrong. It's one thing to confess what you've done, but you now have to admit that you were wrong. A lot of times we stay stuck in our sin because we don't want to admit that we have done something wrong. And that's what I had to do yesterday, that I had to forgive, ask for forgiveness because of my responses was not always godly. And I had to admit my wrongdoing. And he looked at me like, oh, okay. And I said, why are you looking at me like that? And he said, I'm just listening. He had the process that I was admitting that I was wrong because I don't, I don't do it often because I don't feel like I'm ever really wrong to do, doing anything. And I... When I said it, I was very sincere and I know that he received it, but it's the admitting part that makes you feel a little weird. You feel like, mm, I got to say it and you don't want to say it. But when you're repenting, you have to get it out. You got to make sure that you admit it. Then you got to express regret. That's the third um step to repentance. You got to express that you regret. A lot of times we don't regret it. We don't really feel sorry for what we have done. You can confess it. You can acknowledge it. But are you really sorry? Do you really, do you really want to say sorry? Do you really mean it? And it matters that you express that. Do you have remorse for what you've done? And a lot of times we don't. We might say, yeah, I know I messed up. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, I'm sorry. But that's not expressing regret. You have to really truly be sincere when you are repenting. Then you got to commit to changing. That's the first step. You got to commit to changing. Making a determined decision to turn away from sin and conform to a religiously prescribed behavior. What are you going to do to make the difference? Well, my prescribed behavior was asking him, well, would you like to go to church with me? He said, well, I thought you had to watch your grandma. And I said, well, today my cousin Yolanda actually is going to take my day and I'm going to go next week. And he said, well, yeah, we can go to church together. And that was a behavior that we used to do together. But now it was something that we never did no more because 
We just started going our own separate ways. He loved the Lord. I love the Lord. And we just went our separate ways. But however, I was willing to commit not only to changing, but then saying, what was the prescription for our change? Our prescription was to now walk in unity in Christ immediately. And we didn't wait till next week. We didn't wait till next month. But immediately I was willing to say, I'm sorry. But then also say, well, can we now walk together? That ain't easy. Even for me being a minister of the gospel, it's not easy. Because I'm still human. And I feel like I didn't do anything wrong, Lord. But God said, yes, you did. As a woman of faith, even our responses matter. Even our silence matter. Even the way you, um, the, what you say back to somebody and how you say it matters. Because it's hurting somebody even when you don't mean to hurt them. But God knows how you've hurt that person. It says, and then you got to ask for forgiveness, accepting God's forgiveness. Do you believe that God will forgive you? I believe that God forgave me. I had cinder blocks raised, I mean, literally lifted off my shoulder yesterday. They are the five steps to repentance. Confession, acknowledging your wrongdoing, expressing regret committing to the change and then asking for forgiveness. So, um, that was part of yesterday's lesson that I wanted to make sure that I gave to you ladies and gentlemen. So I'm now in judges chapter 11 on the eighth judge. And it says Jephthah, the Gilead, the Gilead, the Gilead night, Gileadites was a mighty warrior. Now, the Gileadites were in the lineage of Manasseh. We know that we talked about that yesterday with Jair. And he was in the um the lineage of Manasseh. That was Joseph and Rachel's children. Right? So he's in that lineage. And it says he was a mighty warrior. Much like Gideon. We know that Gideon was a mighty warrior. God called Gideon a mighty warrior. And his father was Gilead. Now, Gilead was his father, but Gilead is also a place. So I don't want us to get confused because Gilead was a place also where Gideon had fought. Gilead is also a place where Elijah um, lived as well. So Gilead was his father and his mother was a prostitute. Now, it lets us know that Gilead was also messing with women outside of his relationship, his marriage, right? So Gilead was a child that was born outside of, of a family. So this child is now a, a, a product of the father's sin. Listen to be clear. He is a product of sin. And it says Gilead's wife also bore him sons. Now it lets us know in the book of Judges, it's, it's being very clear that Jephthah was chosen to be the judge, even though his mom was a prostitute and his dad was a sinner. I want you to hear this because I want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter what lineage you come from, no matter what has happened in your life, God can use you. It's reminding us of who he was and where he came from. He was not accepted. Listen to me. This prostitute could not take that child around the family and be with this, these people because she was a, a, a side join. She was somebody that he was sneaking with. A prostitute is not nobody that you want to bring outside with you. So once she had her child, I'm sure that the child was not wanted. But God seen him. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God sees you. I don't care what the story was with your mother and father. God still can use you. I need you to know this. Because a lot of times we feel like we can't be used because our parents was not perfect because of the things that happened in our families. But God can still use you. It says Gilead's wife also bore him sons. 
And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. So that means that when Jephthah came around, when Gilead went to go get his son, his children from the wife did not want him there. And they made sure that they drove him away when they grew up. Like, get out of here. We don't want you around. Your mom was a prostitute. We know you're not my mom's child. So we don't want you around. And then he was pushed to the side. He was thrown to the wolves. It says, you are not going to get any inheritance in our family. They said, who does this sound like? This sound much like Hagar and Sarah. This sound much like their story. When Sarah did not want Ishmael to get any other inheritance from, <laughs> from Isaac because of this woman having a child by Abraham. She like, you're not getting none of my child's inheritance. He got to go. This sound like the same story. But God still blessed Ishmael. He still blessed him. It says, you are not going to get any inheritance in our family. They said, because you are the son of another woman. Ain't that something? Is it my fault that I'm the child of another woman? I did not ask to be here. I did not ask for my mother to be a prostitute. I did not ask for your dad to leave your mom and come mess with my mother. And then I am produced. Why is it my fault? But they pushed him away. And now he's lonely. Now he's sad. Now he's depressed. Now he's trying to figure out his life and find out where do I belong. But guess who sees him? <laughs> Come on. El Roy sees him. The God who sees me. Come on. Let, I'm telling you today that God sees you. I need you to know that no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the story, no matter what has happened in your youth, God sees you. It says, so Jeff the fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Now, these people began to follow him. He became a leader without even trying. It says, sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, now the Ammonites is now in a place where they're about to fight Israel, the Israelites. However, the Israelites don't have a leader. Remember, they're all alone because their last leader, their last judge had died, which was Hyair. Their last judge died. So they're, no, they don't have a leader, right? They're about to fight the Ammonites. It says, verse six, come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Now they're asking Jephthah to be their leader. It says, Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me? And drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now? When you're in trouble. Tell somebody. Back then they didn't want me. Now I'm hot. They all on me. <laughs> See you thought you wasn't going to need me. You pushed me away. And you act like you didn't care. You act like you didn't need me. But you didn't know that one day you was going to need me. You didn't know that God was going to use me and I was going to be needed. You did not know that God was going to have me in a position and in a posture that I was going to be the leader and I was going to be able to be used. In spite of my situation, in spite of my lineage, in spite of my upbringing, God seen me and now I have an opportunity to be the leader of the Israelites. And he said, I thought you hated me. I thought you didn't like me. I thought you didn't need me. But guess what? God had to use me. <laughs> I know you talked about me. I know you I know you put your mouth on me. I know you scandalized my name. I know you did. I know you was laughing at me. I know you said, look at him walking away with his head hung low. But you needed me. Now you need me. And he says, why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? I'm in Judges chapter 11, verse 8. The elders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, <laughs> somebody going to have a nevertheless in this season. Nevertheless, they're going to need you. <laughs> nevertheless, they're going to call on you. Nevertheless, you're going to have to help them. Nevertheless, no matter what happened before, nevertheless, somebody going to have a nevertheless. 
They're going to have to come bowing down to you. They're going to have to come scratching and calling. They're going to have to come and say, I'm sorry, I need you. Please help me. Nevertheless, the leader said, nevertheless, what happened? Don't worry about what happened, but we need you now. They, somebody said they're going to have to call me. <laughs> they're going to have to say, Sheeta, where you at? We need you. We need your help. Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. <laughs> I can't stop laughing because I'm thinking about my own life. They're going to need you. I'm telling you today, if you don't hear nothing else, God sees you. And he's going to make them turn around and say, come on, I need your help. I'm sorry. I know I talked about you. I know I put my mouth on you. I know I always said something bad about you, but I need you. They're going to have to call on you. It says, come with us to fight the Ammonites and you will be the head over all of us who live in Gilead. What? Like, I'm going to be the head over all y'all when I just had to go run away because y'all didn't want me? Hmm. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mitzvah. Mitzvah. Now, when he repeated all his words, it was kind of almost like a covenant he was making with God. He, you know, in those times when you say a word, when you make a vow, it stands, right? So he repeated all his words. It says, then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, what do you have against me that you have attacked my country? Now he's the leader now. So now he's doing leader. He's in a leader role. The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. He's telling them what happened. That's why we want to fight y'all because y'all took our land. Jephthah sent back messages to the Ammonite king saying, this is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messages to the king of Edom saying, give us permission to go through your country. But y'all remember, he, they didn't let him. But the king of Edom would not listen. Remember, I, I don't know if y'all remember that, but in, in the book of Genesis, in Exodus, they asked for help to go through Edom. But they said, no, you can't come through. So they had to go around Edom. It says they also asked, they also, they sent also to the king of Moab and he refused. So Israel stayed in Kadesh. Next, they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messages to Shion, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Shion, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jehaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Shion and his whole army into Israel's hand, and they defeated them. Israel took over the land of the Amorites who lived in that country. So he's sharing to the king what happened. And this is what happened because we read it in the book of Exodus before. It says in verse 22, Judges chapter 11, capturing all of it from the R9 to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? He said, no, you don't have no right to take it over. Will you not take what your God, um, Chemos, gives you? 
Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Now we know that God said when they crossed the Jordan, that land was theirs. So he's letting him know that whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zabor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel uh, occupied Heshbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? Verse 27. He says, I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Now he's taking all this on himself. This is Jephthah, the leader now. He's taking all this on himself. He said, you're wronging me. He's trying to have a peaceful transition. He don't want no fighting. He's trying his hardest to talk this thing out. Somebody said, you're going to have to talk it out. It says in verse 27, it says, let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. He's trying to talk it out. He's like trying his hardest to let God do the work. He like, let God be the judge. Let God decide. He's trying y'all. He don't want to fight. It says the king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord. See, sometimes after you done talked it out, you done talked it through, you try to let them know what happened. You want, you don't want to fight. But they don't want to listen. Every now and then you're going to have to still fight. Because they're not going to want to listen. So now it says, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Now God said, I'm coming to help you. He didn't want to listen. He didn't want to take your advice. So now I got to help. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh. Passed through Mitzvah of Gilead. And from there, he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow. Now, after they fought, they won. The Israelites won with him being the judge and being their leader. However, after they won, Jephthah got excited and he made a vow to the Lord. He made a rash vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands... Whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now he was excited to give a burnt offering to God if they win the fight. And in, in his thought pattern, I believe now, um, the, after I did a lot of study on this, the theologians believed that he was speaking about an animal coming out of his house. He did not think that a human being would come out of his house to, that would have to be sacrificed. However, when he said it, because Jephthah was a Israelite, he was in, a, in the lineage of Joseph, which was in the lineage of Abraham. He They sacrificed animals, right? They were not um, in the place of human sacrifice. So he would have never made a vow. This is what the theologians say. He would never have made a vow to have a human sacrifice. However, when he made this vow, it says in verse 32, it says, Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aurora to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel, Karamim, Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzvah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? His daughter comes out the house. Now he already made a vow to God that the first thing that comes out the door to meet him will be the very thing that he will sacrifice as a burnt offering. Means he will burn it on the altar in place of his offering to God. It says his daughter came out to meet him, dancing to the sound of the timbrels. She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes off and cried. 
Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. We know that in the Bible, when they made a vow, they were not able to break their vows. I'm going to go to number chapter 30 real quick. Number chapter 30, verse 2. I want to read this verse real quick. I know we don't got that much time. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. It says, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. So because Jephthah knew that he made a vow to God, that if he win the war, he would sacrifice the first thing that came out of his door. He had to sacrifice his daughter. That was his only child. We already know what he have already been through. We already know that he's a child of a prostitute. We already knew that he was thrown away from his brothers out of the house of his father. We knew that he was already living in a state of probably depression and sadness, having to live on his own because he had no one to be with. And now he's the judge. He just fought. He just won. And now his only child has to be sacrificed. This is why you got to be careful when you make a vow to God. This is why you got to be careful what you say out of your mouth. Because you now have, you are obligated. We must not break our word to God. And the Bible reminds us that when we make a vow, we are obligated to fulfill it. My God. Well, let's finish. I got three more minutes. It says, my father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request. She said, give me two months to roam into the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelites tradition that each year the young women go of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gilead, the Gilead. So one of the um, theologians, as I was studying, said that they just um, set her apart for service unto God. They did not that they did not that he did not kill her. That he just set her to service that she was not able to marry. She was almost like Samuel. She was almost like a priest. She was just set aside to do service for God all of her life. That she was not um, used as a burnt offering. So we don't know if he actually killed her or she was set aside for service. But what we know is that he made a vow as a judge. And at that time he had to fulfill his vow. I'm going to stop right there. Um, at verse 40 of Judges, we will go into, um, the, the ninth judge on, on Sunday, the ninth, tenth, and eleventh judge on Sunday. Um, if there is 12 judges, um, up until Samson in the book of Judges, and then the, the next judge is Samuel. Um, Samuel was a judge, a priest, um, and I, I'm just so excited because it feels so good to learn how all the time that the Israelites did wrong in the eyes of the Lord, he always saved them. He always sent help, much like us. Whenever we do wrong, God always come. He sent Jesus Christ on the cross to die for our sins. He always sends help. We have help, help every day. He is an ever-present help in the time of need. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we don't have to wait on a judge. We don't have to wait on a president. We don't have to wait on a leader. We have a king that always come and see about us. 
I thank God for this for this message today. I pray that somebody's hearts was lifted today. I pray that you receive the word. I pray that you know that God can use you in spite of your lineage, in spite of your circumstance, in spite of what have happened to you. God can still use you. You are necessary. God can use you just how you are. You don't got to change a thing. You don't got to make nothing up. You don't got to shift the thing. All you got to do is repent. Ask God for forgiveness. Be sincere in your heart. Be apologetic. Really, truly re have remorse. And God will do the rest. He will see about you because he has compassion on you. And guess what? Your morning will turn into dancing. Your midnight will turn into day. You will be able to wipe your tears from your eyes. And you will no longer have to walk in sadness or depression because God will change your story. I'm excited about it. So today, if you don't know Jesus Christ in a part of your sins and you say, Rashida, I listen to you and I want that same God, the God that Jeff talked about, the same God that David talked about in Psalm chapter 30. I want that God. I want the God that I can celebrate, the God that changes stories. The God that gives you another chance. I want that God. Well, guess what? I can offer you him today. His name is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. He was whipped. He was bruised. And he was beaten for all of us. And guess what? There's still room at the cross for you. We not all, we not all perfect. We don't all got it together. But guess what? In him, we are perfect in his image because of the blood smeared all over us. So if you don't know him in a part of your sins and you want to get to know him, you can just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved just like that. So if you can repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God and I believe you came to earth and I believe you died on the cross for me and I believe you shed your blood for me and I believe you rose from the dead. Right now, I come to you, Lord Jesus. Because I am a sinner, forgive my sins, cleanse me with your blood, make me clean, and I will be clean. Come into my heart, save my soul. I no longer belong to Satan. I belong to you. I am forever yours, and I am now saved. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to know that today we are on Second Samuel chapter 13, and we are reading a chapter a day. Please keep reading. Listen, we have nine days before we begin our fast. Well, 10. Well, today is 10 going into August 1st. We have a fast from August 1st to September 21st, 52 days. And I pray that you have written down some areas in your life that need to be rebuilt. I pray that you are willing to rebuild your temple, to rebuild your walls, that we will have no gaps, that God will do what, he's, what is necessary for you. Whatever you decide to do for your fast, I pray that you will make it through the 52 days. We will work this thing out together. Every 10 days, we will have an opportunity to come together on Zoom. We will have an opportunity to share our hearts. I'm telling you that we're going to work this thing out. We're going to pray together on, um, I decided on um, July 31st, that Wednesday, if we can come on Zoom together to just pray, to worship God. Um, I want to come in person, but a lot of people don't live in our area. So I really think I want to do in person. Um, I'm going to figure this thing out because it's nothing like being heart to heart and breast to breast. Um, and just being able to worship God together, sing songs of praise and just prepare our hearts for our fast. If no other time in this season, we need God more than ever. We need him to cover us. We need him to change our hearts. We need him to close up the gaps for all of us. I'm excited about this fast. I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in this next season. I know that some things are going to shift for all of us, but I thank God that he is going to be the one that's going to do it. God is going to be the judge. He's going to make the decisions for us. He's going to do what is necessary for us. I'm telling you that God's going to make the difference for your life. So I'm telling you today, write down the areas that need, um, need to be rebuilt. Please, this fast is going to make the difference for you. It's going to make a difference for your family. It's going to make a difference for your lineage. It's going to make a difference for your children's children and for those that are connected to you. I know that God is going to show us himself. 
He's going to show up like never before. So I just thank God for you. I love y'all. I'm so excited for what God is doing in this season. I pray that you come on our prayer call tomorrow, which is at 4.45 a.m. to 5.30. I'm going to give you our prayer call number. If you, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you can write the number in the chat for me, um, let me get it real quick. If you need prayer every morning from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we are on the prayer call three days a week. Um, it is 518-318-5430. We come on at 445 a.m. And I try to give a, just a small, a small short word. We pray. We, um, we share our heart. We share our, um, praise reports, our prayer requests on there. Um, you can share with, with what you have on your heart. The number again is 518 518- 318-5430. Thank you, Tamara, um, for sharing our prayer call. So I look forward to seeing you. Our prayer call, we have almost 28 people on our prayer call every single morning. And we have been standing strong. We have been consistent. And our stories are changing. We have more praise reports now than we have prayer requests. God is doing it. I'm telling you, he is doing it in SGS ministry. So I pray that God shows up for you as he is continuing to show up for me. Um, also, putting your calendar September 22nd. We will be um having a service the day after our our fast is over September 21st. On September 22nd, that Sunday, we will meet at St. Luke and we will worship God. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 20, it's chapter 12, that they had two large choirs that came and sang and dedicated the wall back to God. Well, we're going to dedicate ourselves back to God. We're going to renew our relationship with God. We're going to re-strengthen ourselves. We're going to be restored together. We're going to share our testimonies. We're going to come together in song and sing on September 22nd. I already secured the date. I already secured the location. I'm waiting to secure two more choirs. So I'm looking forward to God to do it. Y'all, let me tell y'all something. God is doing it. Also, I want you to um secure the date, December 28th. That will be our last, um our seventh conference for SGS ministry. I need you to be there. I'm going to need your help with making sure that the place is filled to capacity. So December 28th is a Saturday. I always have my conferences the last Saturday before New Year's. So I'm hoping that you can come. Um, I will have more details pretty soon. But let me tell y'all something. God is doing it already. I am blown away for what God is doing. So I look forward to hearing from you tomorrow morning. I pray that um, you continue to read your word. I pray that this word has helped you today. Make sure you share this live and let somebody know that Jesus Christ loves you. And you do not have to keep crying because we've been indoors for the night, singular. And joy comes in the morning. I love you all. Have an amazing and beautiful Monday. God bless you.